Welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet radio show offering the latest news and interviews with the people driving business, technology, and politics in Michigan. Now, your hosts, Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. Well, just Mike Brennan, Happy New Year. Matt is getting his other knee replaced. I'm not sure which hospital, some hospital in Detroit. A year ago, he got one replaced, and now today he's getting the second. So we're kidding him about being the bionic man, and you know he's going to start challenging people to foot races and things because you know he's going to have those knees, right? Like uh, I can't remember what the guy's name was from the show, but uh, Tanya, no, she will be able to help me with this. Tanya Matthews, longtime friend, been on the show many times. She's now at the Wayne State. Let me. I'm going to get my glasses on so I can read this right the Wayne State STEM Innovation Learning Center. Yes, yes, I am. Good to see you, Mike. And his name was Steve. Steve, Steve Austin, yeah. that's what it was. Steve right? Austin. I get older, that memory thing, you know, I have more of these senior moments, so. Uh, Listen, why else would I become a biomedical engineer? That's ah, good. Man. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see how Matt turns out. He, he's a, he, he's, uh, it's interesting to have elective surgery during the age of COVID. Yes. But uh, I know he has some concerns about that. And uh, he is, apparently he's just going to go and get it done and then come home uh, tonight sometime. So we wish him well with that. So uh, Tanya, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what you guys are going to be doing at the STEM Learning Innovation Center, which of course is mm -hmm. like everything else these days, virtual. Uh, yes. Hopefully sometime this year, we'll go back to something, whatever the new normal is. That not, as, as anybody's guess what that might be, but... <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, this new program and, and what you hope to accomplish. Absolutely. So thanks for having me and uh, reverse those middle two. It's STEM Innovation Learning Center so that we can call ourselves the SILK. Oh, uh, like okay, that. so that's, there you go with that. So mm -hmm. we've got uh, two programs uh, that are kicking off uh, in this uh, first quarter of 2021, uh, The World Still Spins. Uh, the first program is something uh, that we began a call for applications for uh, at the very end of last season. This is the STEM Entrepreneurial Excellence Program. We call it Steep, Steep Detroit, because we believe it is the first of many uh, that we will sort of have in, in cities um, across the way. So Steep is designed to uh, be a bit of a business incubator to help support, uh, in particular, underrepresented women in STEM and STEM-enabled businesses, right? We've got to focus on African-American women because we're in Detroit uh, and folks who are sort of acknowledging being in that space. This is uh, an incredible pilot. So everybody gets the STEM part these days. We talk enough about it. Your business is in tech or about tech or has a tech solution. Maybe it's even chemistry, biology, medicine, but we're also really serious about that STEM enabled. So frankly, these days, unless you're using a carrier pigeon to connect with your customers, you are probably a STEM enabled business. Um, and we're gonna take uh, women who are coming from the STEM side, from the STEM enabled side, from the business side, put them together in a cohort of about 50 women uh, throughout the year. Uh, and help them take their businesses to the next level. That will be interesting. In fact, we should need to track that during the course of the year, perhaps have some of those women on the show to see how those uh, the, the situation is turning out, what you're imparting all this wisdom that you all have uh, with them. And I know, uh, you know, I'm just an old newspaper guy that's learned a lot of new <laughs> tricks and communications I got under control, the rest of it, not so much. And mm -hmm. so really running a business is, is something that's tricky and, and something you have to learn one way or the other, the hard way or the easy way. So yes. this will be more of the easy way, right? Well, we hope so. Uh, and you brought up a really good uh, point. You are in your passion space. You are in news, media, journalism, but you're in this tech space. Now you've got to have folks. And part of what we're doing with some of our businesses is helping uh, early and even mid and long-term entrepreneurs understand when and how to bring in outside voices, to, to yeah. bring in help. What do you learn how to do? What do you hire out? So we've got everything in there from folks who are clearly techie, right? Software is a solution for giant systems like the foster care system in Michigan, right? Yeah. Uh, we're creating, a, she's creating a new platform and thinking differently about that. 
But then we've got someone who frankly is more into taking care of pets, you know, that other child in your family. And so she's working on implantable GPS pet trackers. So we've got kind of the full spectrum. Of course, we've got our beauty products and, and healthcare, a plant-based hair extensions uh, business also came to the table. And different folks are going to come with different skill sets. Um, it's about how to build your business, uh, in particular, how to talk to your customer uh, and be able to serve them better. Okay. Uh, so the, have you already selected your 50 participants? Is that is that done now or are you still in that process? We have selected uh, the first half of our cohort. Uh, so we have got uh, 26 businesses that have been invited uh, to join in the first half of the cohort. I am on uh, embargo to release the specific names and specific ah. businesses uh, until uh, next Who would week. we tell, right? I mean, come on, you know, so. <laughs> exactly, it's just the internet. Nobody uses that. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're very excited. Um, we've got a range of sectors. As I mentioned, we've got businesses coming from all directions. We've got business owners from super strong idea that has been percolating for, say, two or three years to folks who've been in business for 10 and 15 years and need to think about moving it to uh, the next level. One of the particular challenges we have both with uh, women uh, female women entrepreneurs in STEM, as well as underrepresented groups such as African Americans in STEM, is they don't necessarily see themselves as, say, a STEM entrepreneur or a business that is STEM or tech enabled. And so part of it is also about the self actualization, understanding how to walk into a room, present in a room, pitch. When do you use non disclosure? When do you not? When do you ask for extra capital? When you not? There's some cultural things uh, when it comes to STEM and STEM-enabled businesses, as well as obviously, as we've had recent conversations, some very cultural things about coming from certain groups uh, and uh, marking your own path. So we're really excited to launch something like this at Wayne State University. Now, are you still, are invitations being extended or is it still open if other folks would like to participate in the program? And if so, how would they do that? So if other folks would like to participate in the program, there will be a second cohort invited uh, towards the end of first quarter, early spring. And for that, folks can go to uh, stem-innovation.wayne.edu. Uh, we have an entire page uh, dedicated to the SPEAK program. You can sign up for the mailing list and it will keep you up to date in terms of what the folks in the current cohort are doing as well as when we're doing invitations uh, for the next cohort. Now, I assume there's some kind of charge involved in this, or maybe, I mean, maybe my assumption's wrong. So is there a fee? Well, there is no fee, actually, uh, to the participants. Uh, the program, the pilot program, is being funded initially by the National Science Foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. We are looking for additional partners so we can provide additional services as well as expand uh, the cohorts. Um, and there is a small stipend actually for accepted participants. So it's quite the opposite of actually having to, uh, to pay to be in the program. Wow, that sounds great. Uh, now, one of the things you did in your previous life was the Stemanista program for young women. I don't mm -hmm. know if you resurrected that at Wayne State, but uh, are you thinking about it or is that in the works or what's going on with that? So it's interesting that you ask that um, because as I've talked about this program, it has indeed reminded a lot of folks uh, around the Seminista project and when we were working with that. And this is in my category of what I call Seminista rising mm -hmm. uh, as I moved up the, up the stream. So this program is definitely part of that legacy targeting um, uh, older women, older young ladies, uh, mature folks who have chosen STEM and are now figuring out what to do with it or have that STEM degree or trying to actually uh, pick a career in it. So uh, this is definitely sort of part of, of that uh, continuum. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, the building itself, now I know we're not using the building yet, but we hope to use the building right in 2021 at some point, maybe in the That's fall. Right. Uh, is, that, is the building completed or is it still under construction? So the building is completed and I'm knocking on everything that's around me so that things don't fall off the walls as I, as I say that. But yes, uh, we have, have got our completion and we're certified for occupancy. We're putting fantastic uh, bells and whistles in this space. But of course, 
uh, Wayne State University, like many, many businesses and organizations across the state of Michigan and the country are following the science. Uh, and so right now we are definitely on restricted access to the building to keep uh, crowds and contacts low. Uh, so we're launching uh, virtual programs uh, and things that we can begin outside of the building. So the STEEP program that I mentioned is one of them. And a program that's launching uh, at the end of this month is the uh, STEM Innovation Learning Center Fellows. It's funny, mm -hmm. we're gonna have fellows and then we're gonna tell them when they can come in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, the Silk Fellows Program is actually a program around diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM, particularly for STEM-based or STEM-enabled companies, like high-tech companies, like you and I know, because you, you have uh, folks come and talk about their companies all the time on this program. STEM is its own culture. Uh, and so we partner with our office. It's a company founded by Sonia Sepaban. Some folks may remember her. She was a senior VP out here with General Dynamics uh, for quite some time. Uh, she was their VP of engineering. And we're taking a systems engineering approach to diversity and inclusion uh, at corporate culture. Uh, so it's a very exciting project. Um, we're going to bring some fellows on board uh, and connect them with master uh, diversity and inclusion professionals uh, and partner with companies to really make some, some interesting uh, impact there. All right. So you got anything? I know you're you're a busy woman, but you got anything else in the works you want to talk about here in the next minute or two? Well, I would just say that for that Silk Fellows program, uh, a bit again the same website stem-innovation.wayne.edu because we do actually have an open information session uh, coming up uh, this month, so folks can sign up and see what we're doing there. Um, and I would say that I just got notification. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do at the STEM Innovation Learning Center is multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, and collaborative. So yes, for everyone that keeps yelling STEAM into their computer right now, yes, I have you. The building was named before the acronym was created. Uh, but we're actually currently working on the art curation inside the building. Uh, the building uh, will be decorated uh, with actually art from Wayne State University's own collection. So we're in the process of actually uh, installing that artwork uh, actually across this month. One of the advantages actually of the building not being full use uh, during this first quarter that we'll get a chance to, to have all of that in there. So excited for folks to see uh, the works that we've chosen that we think really talk about the STEM Innovation Learning Center, about Detroit, about Wayne State, about the future. I'm very excited about that. Now, if Matthew was here, he would tell you that the STEAM for LTU is architecture because they have a big architectural program. Ooh, nice. Oh, so, yes, that, that's their A. So I'll speak for him since he's not here. <laughs> so we're in the final minute here. This is the shameless <laughs> plug, although we've talked about it, the address and all that several times already. Why don't you give it one more time? You got everybody all lathered up. They want to find out more about this. How do they do that? Absolutely. Go to stem-innovation.wayne.edu. You can find out all the different things that are going on at the STEM Innovation Learning Center. You can also check out our 3D virtual tour of the building that is also live on the site so you can get near and dear. And I will note that uh, the STEM Innovation Learning Center is now one of the hubs for Wayne State University's K-12 programming. So that's also a good way to check in on what your future engineer, computer scientist, biologist, medical professional, or patent lawyer uh, might be up to in the near future, as well as the SEAT program and the Silk Fellows program. Okay, thank you very much, Tanya Matthews. We'll get you on the show again uh, soon, and we can get an update and on how this, all these things, all these various programs are going. Uh, right now, uh, we're going to take a brief commercial break. And we'll be back uh, shortly. Uh, this is Mike Brennan. And, and I said Matt's in the hospital today. But if he was here, he would say, we'll be right back. Lawrence Technological University Thanks, graduates Tanya. earn a degree All right, and see you a later. starting salary. Yeah, I'll get in you fact, when it comes to earning potential, week. the Brookings Institution <laughs> ranks LTU fifth among U.S. Yeah. colleges and universities. Be enriched. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries hey. of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. 
what do you get at Lawrence Technological University? Everything. Great labs and studios, supportive professors, plus a full campus life, NAIA athletics, and all the software you need to succeed. Be smart. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. We're back with the second segment of MI Tech TV. Matthew is out getting a knee replacement today, but we'll wish him well, and hopefully he'll be rejoining us next Monday. The beauty of doing these shows virtually is he doesn't have to travel, doesn't have to drive, just pop, prop himself up in a chair at home and he's good to go. Uh, and so we have joining us on the show. Now, normally we have his better half on the show, uh, uh, Tamara Shoemaker, but today we have Dan Shoemaker, uh, who I've known Dan, gosh, how long have I known you, Dan? I'm, I'm thinking 15 or 20 years now. Yeah, about. And he's a full professor and director of the graduate program in cybersecurity at University of Detroit Mercy. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is that we had uh, Dan Lorman and Richard Steen and Dan a couple of weeks ago talking about it. But I think, have you written a book about this that involves solar winds? I know you wrote a book recently. Maybe I'm getting confused on that. Well, yeah, I've written a lot of books. But um, back in uh, 2012, uh, I was working with DHS on this actual problem. Um, and uh, that led to a book, um, which is available on Amazon. Amazon. What, what's the title? So we'll get that shameless plug in early here. Go ahead. It's, it's really long. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't actually remember it. But if you, if <laughs> I you have the same problem. Yeah, if you Google my name, you'll find it. I, I've got 12 books. So uh, this is something about supply chain risk management uh, and acquisition. All right. So you sent me some questions. I'm going to put my glasses back on here so I can read them. I actually want to take them in reverse order because the, the, the thing about this is when I started piecing it together, when it started to break, I was amazed at the depth and breadth of the hack. And, and your last question is, how long has the government known about this problem and what have they done about it? Well, that would be my very first question is like, wow, I mean, this was a major Russian hack and Apparently, it's been going on for some time, like almost a year before they discovered it, right? Right. The timeline starts in March, uh, and uh, all the evidence points to the SVR um, as the kind of the culprit, uh, Cozy Bear. Um, but um, we've known about this problem since at least 2011. Wow. Uh, I was uh, with DHS at the time and uh in software security and um they had a uh ask, actual task force they put together that i was on um back in 2012 uh what got it rolling was the appearance of chinese malware in some of the weapon systems um that uh we had the pentagon had so the pentagon you know they, they did the usual thing testimony in front of congress uh big bag of cash uh, leading to a study, which I think is probably sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, and um, that sort of pretty much was it. Um, so when this thing appeared, it was like, whoa, this is something that is, I mean, you know, I, we've, we've kind of researched it. We've looked at best, best practices in terms of how to deal with it. Uh, and um, um, here, look, it, it's appeared. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's as bad as you think it is, or maybe even worse, but it's not exactly what you think of when you think of standard hacking and, you know, kind of the basically intrusion detection, all the sort of stuff that goes along with that kind of thing. It's from the inside out. And the thing that makes it so insidious is that it basically is embedded in the, the um, product. Um, this all starts because we buy our software, we don't make it. Um, and so, you know, you go out, you buy a product, you hope you can trust the product not to have something nasty in it. Um, but the problem with the product is it's manufactured up a supply chain. Um, and, you know, for really big enterprise systems, you could have five, six, seven levels in the supply chain. And um, even the, you know, the 
the subcontractors uh, don't really know what's going on in at the bottom of the supply chain where some of the components are being manufactured or a component is being manufactured. And that's sort of what happened here. They haven't been real clear about um, exactly who who corrupted what where, but it all took place inside of the development process that uh, SolarWinds um, kind of has for its product. And um, somebody somewhere, and I can get on onto this if you'd like me to be controversial, but- No, oh, some... I want you to be controversial. Oh, but... well then Len, by all means. Um, SolarWinds has got a reputation for not being real uh, kind of for, for favoring profit over security. Mm. Um, and maybe that accounts for the reasons why the, uh, got the president, uh, found a need to, to spend more time with his family, uh, about the day after the news of this thing really hit the, 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 the press. But bottom line basically is they manage, uh, for profit and security is overhead. So um, they were doing an awful lot of outsourcing uh, of their development um, to places like the Czech Republic, but more importantly to places like Belarus. Oh my God. Which is actually kind of next door to, you know, Cozy Bear. So, um, you know, nobody knows exactly where this was inserted, but somewhere along the line, one of their products, uh, one of their products, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, somebody got into the development process for uh, the updates for their product and uh, inserted a wee beastie that uh, it basically was then inserted in everybody else's um, system because it basically came in signed by solar wind. So the uh, people that were responsible for the actually, you know, for actually identifying it as a problem, um, you know, didn't, I mean, the automated systems didn't pick it up. Um, and um, that's kind of, you know, we don't really know how bad this is or what's gonna, and, and we also don't, this is one instance, but we have no, no, I mean, somebody, you'd think that somebody somewhere would figure out that this is a pretty easy way to get really nasty stuff inside of uh, what amounts to secure systems without going through the trouble of having to be through a firewall to do it. And so what you've got basically is business wanting to do it as cheaply as possible and outsourcing it to the Indians who then outsource it to the Vietnamese, who then outsource it to the Chinese, who then put in the malware and integrate it back up the, to uh, the final product. And so, sorry. I, I find it interesting that they have all these prohibitions on buying hardware from obviously adversarial countries, but that doesn't seem to be an issue by buying software from an adversarial country, right? Well, they don't know. I mean, the problem they've got, and this is one of the things that came in and the, the work I was doing back, you know, eight years ago is that uh, the supply chain disappears to the people at the top. And so you got the vendor and then you've got his subcontractors and then on down the line and about three levels down, what's happening below that is just literally unknown. And so you have a situation where you got a business advantage just to outsource it, scrape a little off the top, outsource it to somebody who does it a lot cheaper and you know, and so on and so on. And <laughs> you can very quickly get to an adversarial country. Um, the fact that they are outsourcing to Belarus, the solar winds people were outsourcing to Belarus for their any of their coding is, you know. Wow, phenomenal, huh? Yeah. So uh, we got about five minutes left here. So let's dig into, uh, I asked Richard and Dan whether we should just burn the whole thing down and start over because that has been the topic, whether it's so woven its way in that you can't get the darn stuff out. What do you think? Should start over or not? Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, um, I actually saw that podcast and, you know, um, I, the, the burning it down problem you're going to have is you're going to have to take down your entire infrastructure and that's not really feasible. And so, you know, the problem you've got with interconnected systems and systems in general is that you can't see the stuff moving around there. What you've got are just a big pile of, of, of hopefully source code, but it could it just easily be unreadable binary. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, taking a torch to that would basically mean you'd have to burn up everything you've done up to this point. And nobody's going to do that. Mm. And so, I mean, you know, the problem in my mind has always been the fact that this is a highly profitable business, um, but we like our software cheap. Mm. And so 
we're not going to buy a product that's twice the price of, you know, a competitor that gives you the same functionality, uh, but is a hundred times less secure. And so, you know, we kind of done it to ourselves. Um, the burning it down part, you're talking about every major federal system right now. I don't I've forgotten how many have been infected, but I think they're up to 18 or 16, um, you know, agencies. Um, and, you know, you don't know what's in there. Uh, if you want to sit down and, and actually read the source code uh, of an enterprise system, I say good luck because that's a few million lines of code. Um, and you don't have that much time in your life. And by the way, it's changed anyhow because they've updated it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I suppose uh, I've, I've heard stories about how they use AI to uh, read source code and, and scan it for malware and things like that. But like you say, there's so many lines of code, probably not a practical method of, of getting it out then, right? One, well, one of the first things that this thing does is install a blacklist that says, don't let in any of the, what amounts to what we know of in terms of the scanners and the potential people that could detect us doing what we're doing. And so it really does sort of kind of burrow down kind of cover itself up uh, and make sure that anybody that could discover it, uh, you know, in the way of AI or any other kind of, you know, um, automated solution right. isn't, isn't going to have, isn't going to have access. And then it calls home huh. and, and that's going on in everything, every product you've got uh, right now, uh, the calling home part. Um, I saw a study where they hooked um, uh, Wireshark to a regular old Sony TV and it called home on a fairly regular basis, two or three times a day, even oh. when it wasn't on. Oh boy. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's the problem you've got is that we're so dependent and it's so embedded that it's really kind of hard to talk about, you know, one drastic solution. Well, we got two minutes left. So what's a simple solution? How should we eradicate this stuff? What's the next step? Well, the, do it right. Um, we actually went through a series of, um, you know, what, what amounts to studies uh, aimed at trying to come up with best practice for this that would prevent it. And it probably would have if they'd actually used it. 10 items or 10 principles, if you want to call it that. And they're in uh, a NIST standard, NIST uh, 800-161, if anybody's interested in that, which is supply chain risk management. Sure. And, um, you know, at least it means that it's a, it's a business solution, not a technical solution. Okay. All right, Dan. So if folks want to find out more, get in touch with you. This is the part where we let you do uh, provide email address or website or whatever you want to provide. Well, um, it's just me sitting here in my little room, uh, Dan dot shoemaker, D A N dot S H O E M A K E R at A T T dot net. Okay. And then if they want to find your books, uh, as you said, you've written 11 of them. You can find those, I assume, on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Just put in Dan Shoemaker and you'll find me. Okay. And we found you today. And so we'll have to get you back on the show here soon, Dan. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank you. Too bad uh, the pretty one wasn't here. Just me. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll get Tamara on later. Uh, so uh, I, I thought maybe it was going to be a tag team. I wasn't sure. So uh, yeah, yeah. Well, she won't allow me when she's talking to you. So I'm, I wouldn't allow her. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay, good. All right. Again, Matt's uh, out getting surgery on his knee today. Uh, it should be just a quick turnaround, he says. And hopefully he'll be back on uh, with us again on uh, next week. But right now I'll just sort of do what he does and say, we'll be right back after this commercial break. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Dan. Lawrence Technological University graduates earn a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, when it comes to earning potential, the Brookings Patrick. Institution ranks hey, LTU. Hey, how's everything? Colleges and universities. Be enriched. I Be heard. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest How's in, everything in, going? in America. Uh, a good, I visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Actually, Why I wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. What do you get at Lawrence uh, Technological uh, University? Than, everything. Wonderful. Great I mean, labs and studios, relaxed, supportive professors, so plus a full campus good. life, NAIA athletics, oh, and all perfect. the software you need to succeed. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. 
And we're back. You just get me today. Matt is out getting surgery on his other knee. Wish him well. But uh, supposedly he'll be bionic when he gets back. And he's challenged all of us to a foot race because he'll be so much faster. Uh, just kidding, of course. We have Fred Brown joining us once again, our epidemiologist extraordinaire. And uh, Fred, we're going to be talking about mutations today, if I recall from your note. Yes? That's right. We'll talk a little about uh, mutations because... Uh, um... Uh, I, I went, we went over a little bit, but um, I was at a conference, um, I, I actually didn't attend, I attended virtually, um, with the UK, and they're having some challenges with mutations that I think are worthwhile taking a look at. But first, we probably should talk about the vaccine distribution. Yes. What do yes. you think? So I thought I would I would show you a quick slide if it's, if it, if it's helpful, yep. um, but uh, we're welcome to answer any questions if you have any at first uh, you want to well, go over. well, that's queuing up uh, right now. I know of uh, the uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer, but I'm hearing AstraZeneca has been approved overseas and Johnson and Johnson's just around the corner. But I don't know if they've been approved in the states. That's right. Uh, J and J should probably be. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll probably have a have a readout of the J and J data. My guess is mid February. Um, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll they'll get done with their they'll get done with their trials, I think, uh, at toward the end of January and, uh, and then mid-February, we should have a readout. And I think by March 1st, uh, J&J will be on the market with a single dose vaccine, mm. which will be exciting. Um, J AstraZeneca was approved. And if you like, um, we can take a look at some of that data, sure. um, which is sort of interesting. Um, maybe, I should, maybe I should start off though with how we're doing overall um, with vaccines generally. Because right now we have two vaccines that have been, been authorized. They haven't been approved yet. Uh, but with, uh, with emergency use authorization, we're allowed to authorize them and we were able to take them um, because we're under emergency and, and having so much challenges with COVID. Right. And this is the situation in Michigan. 90,453 people have been vaccinated as of this morning. Oh. <laughs> so so that's, um, you know, that's, that's a good start, mm -hmm. but we had, um, we, 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 we received um, 337,000 doses. Really? So yeah, so we actually distributed less than a third of the doses that we, that we received. What's uh, the uh, holdup then? Is it, why, why are we not getting these out? Do you know? Uh, well, let's take a look at that. I think there, there, there are three reasons for that. Um, so you can see here, here, here we've totally got uh, we've covered 1.3% of the prioritized population. The prioritized population is about um, 4.31 million people. So about 40% of our population is considered priority. That means that they are over 65 uh, uh, essential or healthcare worker. Those are, that, that's how we define that. Phase one will be 75 years and older and healthcare workers. Phase two will be 65 years and older and essential workers. Phase three uh, will go into everybody at that point. Um, with essential workers being kind of part of phase three um, uh, uh, and then phase four is everybody. So that's the way it, it'll work. That's how we, we've prioritized. Uh, and um, we've been allocated 576,100 doses. That's 13% of the prioritized population. So we should be able to go through that pretty quickly. My guess though is that we're going to have trouble. And here's why. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a book <laughs> for all the people in all the different, different jurisdictions. 130 pages of why we know how to avoid having problems. <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we did every one of them, right? So. Oh man, yeah. You know, so the first thing we did we did is we didn't really prepare properly. We didn't get uh, we didn't get real time systems up and running so we could communicate between the people who are distributing and the people who are set, uh, supplying the vaccine. We didn't qualify enough vaccination vaccinator sites uh, up front. And so now we're doing that qualification, and so it's taking us time. And then we didn't ask for author. We didn't ask for our most critical patients, which are legal and nursing homes, um, uh, whether they wanted to have the vaccine. And, and most of these people have to sign consent form. And we should have been doing that already in November and, and, and December, you know. Um, so those things were missed. And so now we're just sort of getting out of the January first doldrums. And, and of course, we are on a trip of just an incredible problem. With COVID generally, um, and we're, we really are in an ep epidemic situation. We had over 1.5 million people traveling over Christmas vacation, despite our recommendations, Mike. You know, we, we recommended not, not to travel. 1.5 million people a day were traveling. Oh boy! Uh, and so those guys, you know, 
I, my, my guess is, you know, 1% of those people will die, sadly. Uh, you know, 2% will end up in, in intensive care unit wards and probably 5 or 6% will end up in the hospital. That's a lot of people. Uh, and so, you know, and the problem is we start to overwhelm our hospitals. We're getting better at caring for people, but it takes longer for them to get to, to survive, right? Because if you die yeah. quickly, then you're going to empty a hospital bed. But if you die slowly and, and then get better, um, you don't empty the hospital bed. So we're really overwhelming our hospitals, which is uh, going to be a, a challenge. And, and we're and you know, the, you know, everyone I know who's working at, at hospitals is just completely burned out, right? They've been working 12-hour days every day uh, since March. You know, and that you just can't sustain that. And right now we're getting to our peak of having to vaccinate everybody and having to take care of more people than ever. Mm -hmm. And that's, wow, right? <laughs> that's that's, that's yeah, really rough. Having having no many nurses in my life and uh, dated some of them, I know that there's, there's the burnout issue to begin with being a nurse. Oh yeah. But these, uh, this is extraordinary times for nurses and of course doctors and everybody else associated with this. But but you have to wonder if all these women that are men, men that want to go into nursing are now going to reconsider that after this, right? Well, uh, and, and sadly, uh, if you look at the healthcare workers, they are much more impacted by um, uh, by, by this by, by this virus uh, from a health standpoint uh, than others. They're they're already overtired, not sleeping enough, not as well nourished as they probably should be, and so they're more susceptible generally. Um, and then, and, and then uh, nurses uh, represent about 40% of the total number of, uh, of, of healthcare professionals getting infected. Mm -hmm. so the nurses really are taking the brunt of, right. of this, uh, with the doctors, of course, uh, uh, being a, a lower percentage of, of the population, but also being 10% affected. So um, we're both in Ann Arbor, and I know I saw a statistic that the U of M alone employs like 4,000 nurses up oh, there yeah. on, on the hill where all those hospitals are that's right yeah yeah uh you know they're the front they're the front line they're they are are <laughs> they are what makes us better or not right. um well uh, i guess they're here so this is the situation we've got and you ask what you know what's the pot what is the problem the problem is we had a 20 million person goal remember we were mm -hmm. saying by the end of the year we're going to try to vaccinate 20 million people we shipped only 12 million doses, so we couldn't have achieved our goal, but we only actually injected 2.7 million people as oh. of, Dece of December 31st, 2020. Um, and so we really were off by almost a factor of 10. And, and now uh, President-elect Biden um, wants to do 100 million patients in the first 100 days uh, of his presidency. And that's going to be really rough because if we're starting from a point of only doing you know, um, only doing a few hundred thousand a day, about 500,000 a day, and you want to get to uh, 25, you know, 20, uh, kind of 70, I guess you want to get to about 75,000 uh, or 100,000 shots per day. Yep. Um, wow, you know, you got to, there, there, there's, a, there's a long way to go uh, up that ramp. And you can see, I think uh, there, there are three critical factors. The first is, can we manufacture enough of it? Uh, we have very constrained raw materials. It's a very complex process, very little experience. I'll show you that in a second with the, with, the, with, with this kind of vaccine. The distribution, we've got an allocation bureaucracy we talked to a little about before. We want to make sure we get the sickest and most at risk for transmitting people vaccinated first. The problem is if you hold up everybody else because you're figuring out where those people are and trying to get to them and deciding whether they want the vaccine, and then you start losing time. Um, and uh, our biggest our biggest bottleneck right now is actually the vaccinator sites. We yeah. can't vaccinate in, you know, we need to open up like Henry Ford, uh, the, the, the Ford Field. You know, <laughs> we have to do like, you know, five, 6,000 people in a day at a, at a single site. And uh, we just don't, aren't, aren't equipped to do that. We're equipped to do kind of onesie twosies at local Walgreens. And that's, a, that's actually the biggest problem we're going to have in the short term. I think we'll overcome it um, eventually with big, with big events. But, uh, I did yeah, read uh, in one of the competing publications that the U of M is using the football stadium yeah. up in the upper tiers uh, where the, the alumni and the high rollers are, you know, those boxes. Uh, but I think it's more of the internal. They're in vaccinating their own people. I assume once they get through all that, they could turn that over and bring in the public, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that's planned. You know, I'm sure they're going to be doing that and, and uh, because they don't want them clocking, clocking up the hospitals, you know that, that that then you get well people interacting with sick people, and and then you have real challenges. If you can bring it, take them off the side of the hospital, that would be ideal, and so on. I think sure. that, that you will we'll be doing that. 
Um, I haven't talked to U of M directly about, about their overall plans. I've, I've talked to them about vaccination procurement, which I think would be helpful to them, but I haven't talked to them about dispersion, uh, uh, like I have with the rest of the state. And then finally, the, the last big issue we've got is communication, right? We talked about the fact there's very little communication within the supply chain. We, we actually know what's going on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you know, you think about trying to vaccinate one percent of your population every day wow. um, at the, at a peak, and you're only getting uh, the information once every other day. <laughs> you yeah. can you can get off really really fast to the supply chain that, that was, was this kind of a fragile supply chain that has to you know, that, that has a very short time frames in which you have to vaccinate once you open the pack. Um, and the other big thing is we're not really monitoring herd immunity yet. Um, that that slide I showed you from uh, the what was from the Washington Post. And right. that is trying to monitor herd immunity, but that has to get up more. So this is sort of where we are right now. And here's what manufacturing looks like. I don't know if you ever thought about how they manufacture this stuff. No. But this is extremely high technology. Um, you know, we're talking about getting a DNA template. So you're talking about a very, very small uh, piece of piece of the DNA that is exactly templated so that you get what you want, that sort of the code for the protein and, and the RNA that you want. So you create this template and then you put all the RNA materials into a vat and you incubate. So the first thing you've got to do in order to, uh, to do the template is you got a cell culture. Well, cell cultures are hard to ramp up. Uh -huh. you know, it's cell by cell, very low yields. And then you got to purify all that stuff because you want to make sure you just get the right ones, not, not, not everything uh, that you put in there. And then you've got to they'll linearize it. So you got to make it flat so it codes, it codes nicely, it doesn't all fall up. Mm -hmm. um, so th then, then you move into the next phase, and, and for example, uh, Pfizer does that, that that first phase in in St. Louis, and then they move that whole that, that whole put template over to man. Uh, then they move it all, all over uh, to Andover, Massachusetts, and then they push put all the mr uh, uh, messenger RNA materials and all the things they need to put into the, the vat. They stir, stir it around, cook it a little while, uh, and incubate it, uh, and then the DNA slowly produces all this mRNA. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to pull that out and you've got to stabilize the mRNA because the mRNA is real small and super fragile, right? I mean, these are these are molecules that are designed to unzip, reproduce, and rezip again. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the forces that hold them together are tiny, mostly van der Waal forces. So it's very, very hard to keep these things going. And then you got to purify the whole thing. And you can't purify it too re rigorously. You're going to break it all up and destroy it. So that, that all <laughs> happens at the next site. Then they move it all the way across. They move all the fragile mRNA all the way across the country to Kalamazoo, our, our state, our place. And Kalamazoo, what they do is they encapsulate the mRNA, it's all carefully manufactured, uh, with, with, with an oil, with, with a lipid. Mm -hmm. And the lipid has to be a certain size. You can see that it has to be about 100 nanometers. If it's too big, it starts getting caught up in the liver, caught up in the kidneys, it doesn't uh, release properly. If it's too small, the immune system doesn't, doesn't recognize it as being a foreign body. So it's got to be just the right size. You got to encapsulate just this, the right stuff into it. And then it has to sneak by and sneak into the cells. And that's the vaccine. And, and then it starts producing the, the protein that you're interested in. So it's, it's, it's sort of a miracle this stuff even works, right? I mean, this is very challenging uh, stuff uh, to, to do. And then you've got to you know, fill it all in a small vials, right. uh, which all sterilized process. And this, this is, you know, these are brand new manufacturing facilities, larger. So you're bringing them on stream. It's all super regulated. You've got to have the FDA come in, take a look at everything, make sure you're passing all the right stuff then you got to splash freeze it all and then you start shipping it around the country having Pretty said all crazy. that i think we're going to be okay with manufacturing <laughs> yes. that's uh well let me get you back to, i know you, if you don't mind i know you shared with us that you have talked to the biden administration yeah uh, and advise them uh, by memorial day he wants to get those 100 million vaccinations done given all the issues that we now face is that realistic? Uh, I think we're going to miss. I think we're going to be at about 75 million now. Okay. It, 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 you know, it, 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 but not, not, not too bad, right? right. Um, so the, the real big issue that I was talking about was, was, was the fact that we don't distribute into big operations. We don't, we don't you know, line up like we do in the Army. You know, yeah. everyone lined up and you, you, you vaccinate 100,000. With the little gun uh, thing, yeah, right. With, with you the know gun. So. We don't do that very well here. Yeah. So that, this is the, that, that's the, 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 biggest, the, the biggest issue. And uh, so I think we're going to solve that issue uh, probably around the 100 day mark. And then we'll slowly, you know, roll out from there. But I think that uh, I think through March, we're going to be pretty frustrated. 
Well, we were guess. talking earlier about maybe using the National Guard because that's what they do really well. They're, you know, that's what they're trained to do, those sorts of things. And getting them involved were maybe like, I don't know whether you could just like roll up in a car and roll yeah. down your sleeve, roll up your sleeve and get zapped or whatever. I don't know if that's the way it could be done, but what do you think? That, that, that's what my, my recommendation was to do with mobile units, was to have okay. mobile units that have the vaccines that were able to move around state to state. Uh, and, and we don't need that many mobile units to do that. Uh, and we'll see whether or not uh, they, they accept the advice or not. Um, sure. Those most mobile blood units that are, have refrigeration capabilities and those could be the things that I think could pull us out of this problem. If not, it's gonna be uh, catch as catch can, lots of learning curves, different experiences and so on. It's gonna be frustrating. I did wanna talk a little bit about the mutations as you pointed out though. Yeah, go ahead, sure. And that, that is a tricky area. <laughs> and, I, and you know, we talked about it early and um, basically, um, this is, you know, if, even if you've got a very good vaccine, we've got a 95% ac you know, uh, efficacy, efficacious vaccine with, with almost no side effects uh, um, or, or a serious adverse events. And the problem is that um, the, that the virus moves around quite a bit. It can, it can mutate. Um, and that can cause it to have higher transmissibility, higher virulence rates. And, and of course, the host, we, we're all a little bit different. And so differences in the host make a difference. Your age, predisposition, uh, the, uh, health status and so on. So we are at a point where we think this vaccine, this Pfizer or Moderna vaccine is, lar it is largely in that upper right-hand corner where one vaccine is working for everybody initially. But um, the problem is that over time, um, either you've got a waning problem like we have with the flu. Every year you have to retake the flu and that, that requires a lot of boosters. Or um, if you have a very high mutation rate, you can even cause brand new kinds of disease to come out. Um, and so uh, you have to get new vaccines, not just a booster for the old vaccine. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at that, you know, as, uh, at what, we, what, what we've done. Because this, this return, and, and you remember, you, you mentioned, gosh, what about that variant in the United Kingdom? All I right. want to know more about that, remember? And yep. so we talked briefly about that. Well. Now we know a lot more uh, because the United Kingdom actually has one of the best genetic sequencing uh, operations in the world. And so we mm. can actually look at the genetic sequences of these viruses and trace where they come from, how fast they're mutating, who's got them, who doesn't have them, what part of the country they're in, and so on. And it's quite interesting work. And um, so here's what we, we found. What we've done is we've created basically our, all our antibody therapeutics uh, and our vaccines and our diagnostics are all based on the spike protein, right? That's that, the, the, the coronavirus looks like a big ball with spikes on it. And those mm -hmm. spikes that, you know, are uh, at the tip and those spikes come in, they, 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 they latch onto our cell and we they look around for the angiotin, the, the, the ACE2 inhibitor. Uh, they find the ACE2, they, they, I'm sorry, they find the ACE2 <laughs> uh, 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 binding site uh, and they bind to it. And so we thought, aha, if they have to bind to that, if we have a vaccine or a antibody or a diagnostic that also binds to that, then we've got something that will bind to the virus and we can tell much more about the viral load. We can stop the virus. We can clog it all up and it, it won't be available for binding. And so we created all these, uh, all these diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines that target the spike protein on the Wuhan lineage. So the Wuhan, Wuhan remember, was where it all started. Mm -hmm. And we started that January. We had the, the genetic code already January 10th. So we've been working steadily on creating something for the Wuhan virus there. And we, um, you know, what's nice about the code uh, about, about these viruses generally is that they have a slower mutation rate than men. They are, they're, they mutated about half the rate uh, as the flu, but one mutation every 10 transmissions that comes out to two amino acid replacements per month. Uh, which means you've got about 10 to the minus three sites per year change. Hmm. It doesn't sound like too much. That sounds like it's manageable. Um, and, but the problem is that if we have mutations that are localized in the spike protein, it could change our ability to treat it, right? Because everything we're going at is at the spike protein. And it turns out we actually have to do that. Because if we don't go after the spike protein, we actually call, could cause what they call ADE or antibody um, well, it, 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 it's an enhancement of, of the virus. Mm -hmm. And unintentionally, you've got this 
antibody that attaches itself to the virus. It doesn't affect the spike protein. Where, uh, and so it changes the virus and can make it more virulent. Mm. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. No. Uh, and so you got to go after the spike protein. Well, unfortunately, we found um, that um, despite, uh, despite the fact, we, we, we do very little genetic, genetic sequencing in the United States, sadly. Mm. Only about 0.3% of our uh, of the positive samples that come back are actually looked at. The UK actually um, does that at 7.4%. So they're about 20 times, they do more than 20 times the, 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 the amount we do. Um, Japan does about 10 times the amount uh, and so on. You can see Australia is a, a winner here with 58%. We're going to have to start doing this much more because here, here's why. It turns out that the spike protein in these viruses has a lot of what they call plasticity. It means that it can still attach itself to our ACE2, our ACE2 binding site, uh, and but it's changed quite a bit. Uh, and in fact, what we're finding is it actually is getting better at, 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 at binding uh, to the ACE2 inhibitor site, uh, the, ACE, the ACE2 binding site, uh, then, and, not, and not worse. And so there are two big variants that have come through. The first one is the one that we talked about in the UK, and that has two deletions. And that causes um, its ability to bind uh, to this a, to the, to the ACE2 the ACE, uh, uh, site uh, in, our, in our bodies, 85% better than before. Mm -hmm. And it also produces a lot more phlegm and stuff, uh, uh, a lot, lot more of what they call viral shedding. Mm. So you're, not only is it more <laughs> more attracted to your body, but you're actually produce the, the people who are affected produce more of it to, to attack your body. Um, and so what happens is this is this is transmitting very very fast. And what happens is these little mutations that we didn't think very were, were going to be so important actually have a chance to live, right? Because they're transmitting so much faster if they're attached to the other other mutation that we've got a lot more genetic variation than we thought we would, and and, and that and that's going to cause a lot more. Uh, a lot, a lot more disease. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you look at D 1.1.7, that's the variation. It has 17 mutations compared to the Wuhan linkage. So li lineage. So if you look at the old Wuhan one. It was a, almost a, quite a different molecule than what we're, and that's what we actually have all our medicine for, than what we're actually trying to attack now. And the way viruses work is this will become the virus. This will become COVID in UK. There won't be any more Wuhans left, pretty much. It'll mm -hmm. all be this virus that's so much more uh, transmittable. Uh, and this directly, of course, impacts our herd immunity targets because it actually changes R. And remember R and the herd immunity, it's one, it's one minus one over uh, R. So the more your R increases, the more percentage of the population you're gonna have to have vaccinated in order to stop this virus. Hmm. The other one is this, this FO1V2 South African variant. And this apparently is more deadly to the young people who get it. Uh, we're not, we haven't even gotten statistical data yet. Uh, and we're not, it's actually so different from the Wuhan virus that we don't, we're, we're not sure that our vaccines even going to work against it. So now, that, the variation, uh, would part of that be ethnicity perhaps or something? Or, or? There, is, there could be something of the host. There could be something of the host. Luckily, Johnson & Johnson is, does have active vaccination trials on, and as does AstraZeneca, they actually have active trials down there. And mm -hmm. so we're going to be able to find out pretty quickly whether it works or doesn't work. Uh, by, but we have to make sure that they are able to look at the, and, and, and look at the strains for people who are getting the vaccine. Now. So that's going to mm -hmm. increase the amount of study we do. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened in South Africa. See that yellow bar? Mm -hmm. now, South Africa tests about as much as we do. And you can see that they were completely surprised because from October 5th, they had no, you didn't see anything, uh, any of this variant. And by November 30th, uh, about a month month later or so, it was 90% of their over 90% of their sample. Hmm. So that's that's a real fast penetration of a very much more active virus, right? And this is the one we don't think is going to actually we may not, our vaccines may not even work against it. Hmm. Now let's take and that so that's what happens in, in 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 South Africa where we don't have very good control. In here in England we have much better control. Mm -hmm. And you can see that slowly but surely, this variant, this is the B1.1.7 variant that we're worried about also. So basically, it got to about 1%. Uh, you know, it was, it was sort of baseline levels all the way from, um, you know, January all the way through. Uh, this, this is 10. So this is 10-1. Uh, uh, that would be October 1st. And you can see it kept going a whole month. It was about 1%, 1%, kept going. And by 
you know, by around the middle of November, it was around 2%. And all of a sudden, it's, it is now about 80% of the total new buyers we're seeing in the UK. Well, the UK kind of panicked. Mm -hmm. They said, holy cow, you know, because what, what happened is the UK put on really aggressive lockdown measurements um, right at uh, the 31st of, of, of October. Remember, you couldn't go to a pub, you couldn't go on public transportation, everyone, all the schools were shut down. They went on really advanced um, lockdown. And you can see on that blue, uh, if you measure the blue lines, they're actually coming down. So the old, the old measures worked for the blue lines, right? We designed our measures for the blue lines, the blue lines work. Well, they don't work for the orange ones. Hmm. Despite incredible draconian lockdown measures, nothing's working on this orange one. So they're panicking, all right? Um, and, and, they're, and in spite of locking down even more, every, every one of their, every, every country of the UK, they got four kingdoms, um, is now at what they call level four. That means you can hardly move. Mm. <laughs> you, know? you, can't, you can't have, you can't do anything. Uh, and in spite of that, it's still growing. So, uh, and you can see this, this, this taking off. So they've put in new distancing measures. They put in, they, they're not, and now they're recommending, let's go ahead and try to go a single dose vaccine. Just let's get some vaccines into everybody as fast as we can. In fact, and if you don't know which vaccine you had before, that's okay, just take two. <laughs> take two of anything you got. We'll just mix and match here. <laughs> um, and, and, and you know what? This hospital that you guys used to go to for everything, it's only gonna be for COVID. Uh, and so they, these are huge operations. Right? These are big shifts. And the other thing they did was they approved the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine. And let's take a look at that. So here is our vaccine, right? And that's the Pfizer Moderna vaccine. You can see that you know, we had a very good outcome, right? you know, great, great vaccine. Um, now here's the AstraZeneca vaccine. They, um, they, they looked at a lot fewer people than we did, right? They, they looked at about a third to a quarter of the people we did uh, in that AstraZeneca. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the males were underrepresented. They only had 40% male, 60% female. But the worst thing is over 65, they only had 600 people over the age of 65 vaccinated with, with the active ingredient. Hmm. And that is not enough. And those are the people who are most at risk. And you can see that the black African-American population is only 4%. So again, you know, they, um, they, and, and they had to pool the data from four different trials, each of which had slightly different kinds of, of, uh, of protocols. Uh, and so they actually are vaccinating one dose. And then on average, they're waiting eight to 12 weeks. They're waiting like three, four or five months later to have a second dose. And that actually gives them their best results, believe it or not. Not four weeks. The problem though, is that in that period, after one dose, the efficacy is only 50%. Hmm. So you're sitting there with lots of people who, can get, who are probably feeling, hey, I got my vaccine go out, going out and, doing, and having worse behavior. And they're actually not terribly well protected. After two doses, you're only at 70%. So uh, my recommendation is wait till the U.S. approves this vaccine. Don't go to England, get a, get a first dose of this stuff, and then come back and try to get a Pfizer Moderna. Keep your yeah. Pfizer Moderna uh, if you can, especially if you're elderly. So that's what's happened. And uh, why don't we, uh, I guess we're getting pretty close to the end. I can kind of talk about all the different things that are happening uh, with you in that, uh, that next week uh, in terms of how we, how we can combat this. Because it, it is a big issue if, if our vaccines don't work. Um, uh, because we got fast enough mutations and we get panicky because, and then start to allow sort of suboptimal therapeutics to get onto the market, mm -hmm. that's not going to help our, our cause much. So, um, so let me ask Dave. Dave, can we run over about five minutes? Is that fine? Sure, I can show you another one. Yeah, no worries. All right, keep firing. So here, so here are the mutation threats, right? The first mutation threat um, is that you get, the, is it the, what they call escape. So the, the, the first thing that happens with mutation is you could escape from vaccine-induced immunity. And that's what we're worried about. That's what we're worried about uh, in South Africa. We think that it's changed so much that it can escape our vaccines. Mm -hmm. We're not sure yet. So we said, I said no, but it's really unknown. It's not really, it's not really the answer isn't really no. We just don't know. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, but it is very likely uh, that the experts in the UK, both the UK looking at the B1.1.7 uh, and the experts in South Africa looking at the 502v2 variants are saying there is enough plasticity here in the binding site, uh, they call the RBM, it's, 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 it's the area that really binds directly to that receptor that we've got on our cells to, in order mm -hmm. to let the vaccine reproduce and enter our cells. It's, they said, 
probable, not just likely, probable. And usually, you know, when we assign to say probable, it's over 60% hmm. chance that we are going to have to um, find other, we'll have to supplement our vaccine with other solutions. So what's likely to happen based on this, what we know so far, is that this might become an annual event. It might become an annual vaccine like the flu. Unfortunately, this thing is about, uh, it's, it's probably two to three times more transmissible and it's about 10 times more deadly than the flu. Mm. So it's, you know, it's just like the flu vaccine, except you better darn get it. <laughs> you can't, uh, you know, it or, or you can like, get it again. It sounds almost like whack-a-mole. Every time you get a solution for something somewhere point. in the world, then something else pops up elsewhere, right? That's exactly, it's a perfect example of, that, of, of the sort of whack-a-mole approach uh, that we're going to have to take with this thing. We're going to have to also probably do serology testing. That means every once in a while, probably, you know, once every half a year, maybe every year, you're going to go in and get a blood test and they're going to then be able to say, here are the antibodies you've got to this thing. Your vaccine's still good or you had that, you had COVID a couple months ago, you're still good to go. We still have high enough uh, neutralizing, what they call NAV, that neutralizing antibodies in your blood that you can, you're safe. Um, but if you go down to a certain level, you're going to have to get a, a booster shot. Um, so you're or, thinking like every you know, six months, you'll have to get checked by somebody, you know? If, if this is as bad as we think it is, it might be that often. I'm hoping it's once a year, but uh, it, it, but it's sort of on that range. And for older people, especially, I think we're more at risk with older guys. Uh, and I think as a result of that, we're going to have to actually increase the amount of PPE we have and the amount of diagnostic testing we've got because we want to know where those communities are that are having you know outbreaks and get to them fast because we know that our if, if the vaccine if the if virus has a chance to really replicate a lot it's going to find new variants that are more successful against their vaccines so we want to actually suppress uh the, the the viral outbreaks even faster than we do today the second big so that that's escaping from vaccine induced immunity right the, mm -hmm. the other way, well, big question is what about when you got infected if you're naturally infected you know how long do those antibodies last? And mm -hmm. we think right now more than four months, but we're not sure how much long, how long beyond four months. Right now, um, we do see cases of reinfection after four months. There have been you know, 10, 12, 15 that we've watched. So it is likely that, that we'll have, these, these variants will actually uh, uh, allow for reinfection to occur. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably less likely than the vaccine-induced immunity because there's not as much selective pressure. Right, the vaccine actually puts a tremendous amount of selective pressure to find those ones fast. But whereas the natural immunity reinfection, not quite under much as much selective pressure. But that means again, it's the same. It's the same result, though. Probably a more regular vaccination will be required. More PPE is going to be required. The next big question we've got is, gosh, what happens if this stuff actually increases the clinical severity? Right? What happens if you get really sick? Uh, and right now we're getting sick and people are dying at one you know, percent rates. What happens if it goes to two, three, four, five percent rates? Hmm. Um, well, in, we think we're starting to see that anecdotally with the young people in South Africa. Oh, really? So we we, don't, we haven't confirmed it yet. It's just anecdotal. Um, but it, we don't. I don't think it's that likely. I don't think it's quite as likely as as the escape from uh, immunity. And here we're going to have to have if, if this does start to happen, we're going to have to have much better antiviral technology, much better, and especially uh, symptom therapeutics. And we're going to have to, of course, do the serology to figure out where the antibody is, what kind, what, 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 what kind of virus we've got. Hmm. The, 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 number, the fourth thing about, about a genetic mutation is it can reduce um, your treatment effectiveness. And we have two kinds of treatment effectiveness. The one is when you actually treat this very sick person in bed, right? Uh, and that's what we're doing with from severe. That's what we're doing with some of these monoclonal antibodies is if you get really sick and you go to the hospital, then you get, go ahead and get you know, injected with the monoclonal antibody, and that really makes you feel better. And you saw that with President Trump. Um, uh, uh, we need to have more options, right, for that. And, um, and especially the more antiviral options, not just the symptomatic stuff. The biggest challenge, though, is that a lot of people, because we have a lot of this sitting on the shelves, it's not taking as much as it really should be. About a quarter of it's uh, only been, only about a quarter of our supply is actually being used right now. The biggest thing that I would start to worry about, and I do start to worry about, is that what about the healthcare workers? They see the stuff sitting on the shelf. They know it's going to be prophylactically protective, right? So if you take this stuff, you're much more, your, your defenses are great for 150 days or so. Um, and, and so the risk is that doctors, nurses start to see this stuff and, and start to say, you know, let me take that. 
and 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 if they enough of them do that, we're going to have a very fast movement toward selecting uh, for a mutation that's going to get around uh, the antibodies and all of our antivirals. Of course, we have that increased transmission, and we saw that result with the B1.1.7 variant in, in the UK, and that's what happens, right? Um, we need to have a lot better PPE, a lot better diagnostic testing, a lot better distancing, and that's what the UK did. They said, everybody, no one, no one's allowed to see anyone outside their families. You can have up to six people for dinner. That's it. Uh, that's got to be within your family, and they got to be living in the same home. You can't go out shopping. I mean, it, it's it's really draconian over there right now, and in, in, in the entire country. I mean, we're not talking about little, little pieces here. It's the whole country shut down. And so then, of course, they have like food delivery to them. How do they eat then, right? A lot, a lot more delivery. Yeah, a lot, okay. a lot more delivery. And 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 you, if if you're not working, um, uh, they've got oh uh, no, uh, no one's allowed on the streets after eight p.m. You know, really? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, unless you're going to going to work uh, or, or have an emergency that, that, that you know no more walking the dog. You know, oh, it's time to, no, no, <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're talking uh, big shifts. Yeah. yeah, and then of course the last issue that we got is that it could shift enough that most of our diagnostics are also focused on the spike protein because uh, it's the most important part of the virus and the, uh, for us it's, it's most exposed. It's ready there. We can attach ourselves to it and detect it. Um, and um, uh, we're already starting to see that happen, that certain parts of these variants can't be detected by certain kinds of PCR testing already. And that's our most accurate testing. So you can imagine the antigen testing that are coming out, they're gonna become even less, uh, less accurate uh, if these mutations become large enough uh, to affect. It's like the, the Black Plague from 1300s is returned here or something. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it, it, it did concern me, you know, I, I'm hoping that this won't happen. Um, but there's enough suggestive evidence here that says, if we don't get our, if we don't get our monitoring up, you know, if we don't start genetically testing a lot more and knowing where these things are coming from and who's got which kind of virus, um, and how fast it's mutating and, and, and which drugs are best for that one versus this one, we're going to get in real trouble really fast. You know? Unfortunately, we could. It could beat us. So, you know, we're, we're starting to see the first volley. They won the first volley. We, we've come back now with our vaccine. We're winning. But well, they're going to come back with their with their response, right? So we got to keep vigilant. And I thought one of the stark pictures that I saw from New Year's Eve was in all the capitals of the world except China, everybody was like, nobody was on the streets. But in China, there were millions of people out whooping it up. And I'm thinking, what? You know, so, uh, yeah, crazy, huh? Yeah. No, even in Australia, where they're really trying to, they, they, there was no one on the bridge this year in Sydney and so on. It was, it was wild. And here, I mean, uh, you yeah, know, I watched Times Square. I mean, Times normally Square. they got a million people, thank God, uh, packed in there. And this year it was just the TV people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I am worried about all the, all, about all the travel, uh, you know, and the, the problem, and I've done, uh, next week we can talk a little bit about projections because I've done my projections for through April 1st now. Ah. Lock those in. I was, I was within 200 people. Uh, uh, accuracy <laughs> from my November projections in terms of death. All right, I guess we'll let you happy. have that. I mean, 200 is okay, but you got to do better next time, Fred. So <laughs> that's, that's less than a tenth of a percent. Yes. Okay, so yeah, well, that, 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 that's be... luck when you get that close. But but we will talk a little bit about now. now the thing I'm the reason I'm so worried is because these mutations they can affect my models. You know, I, I'm going to have to now put in my model in my model an even higher number than I was anticipating before, which is already in the, you know, 570,000 by mm -hmm. April 1st. And now we're going to exceed that because mm -hmm. of the mutation. Worries. Actually, we could have a million people dead by summer, right? If all things go wrong. Oh, well, if we do it badly. Yeah. I, I, I don't think we're going to be, I don't, I don't think we're going to be in the, you know, even in the mid 600s, but that's still a lot of people. I mean, that's so much. That's another three hundred thousand from where we're at. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and it, it, everybody was thinking it was just old people that were dying, but now it's all over the place. It's young people, middle-aged people, everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, we got we you know the virus found the easiest first, right? And that was the nursing homes. We, right. we, we got into the nursing homes with transmitting nurses with and with the vulnerable people, vulnerable people. So if you look at the early data, you know nursing home population was 1% of the total population and it was 40% of the total death. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're seeing a real flattening of that. And we're starting to see that the nursing homes are protecting themselves better. And now it's going to the general population level. Yeah. I mean, I just 
I, uh, this is your field and that mine. I just never thought of a virus as being smart, but clearly they are, right? Yeah, uh, you know, if, if you got enough, there, there, there's some really famous uh, books um, uh, that are, you know, like the, 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 I forgot the exact name, but it, it talks about the fact that if you get enough mutation and enough and enough uh, variation, and you have enough selection pressure, you can sure. create the Swiss watch, you know, okay. out, out of out of out of out of a link of DNA. All right, I just got flagged by Dave. Uh oh, uh oh, Dave, Dave's giving us the, the hook. He's got other stuff he has to do, and so we appreciate him engineering the show. So we'll talk about all these things next week, uh, what we didn't get to this week. Uh, Absolutely. It just seems like there's, there's always so much to talk about, right? Every I know, I think every day, every week we talk, and I say, oh, that's it. You know, we're done now. And that, <laughs> next week, we've got a million more things to talk about. Wait, 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 there's, a... more. <laughs> wait there's more. Wait, yes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pleasure, but but I but I I, I wish I wish we wouldn't have as much to talk about. Actually, <laughs> it would be a lot better off. Yes, I mean it's it it never seems to. I think I can't be any more concerned or scared from the previous show, and then you come up with the new stuff that scares me even more. Oh. <laughs> Well, I was scared. We're not, and these are guys who are used to seeing viruses. You know, they've been they've been all over the world, like I have, and and guys who I know who are very calm were saying, "This oh doesn't boy, work. Yeah, this isn't good." Yeah, okay. We'll leave everyone with that thought. Oh boy, this isn't good. And so come back next week, and Fred will have even worse news for you. I hope not. No, I hope not. Things will get better. I promise. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Fred Brown, our epidemiologist. And it's been a most enlightening segment. And uh, we'll be back next week. Hopefully, Matt will be joining us. If not, uh, I, uh, hopefully, I can handle it on my own. Uh, but thanks for joining us on MI Tech TV. And uh, we'll see you next Monday. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I got this invite to this conference and I was seeing data I couldn't believe. So, uh, I'm sorry, well, I sound like he has to jump. But... Yeah, he's just doing the outro. Yeah.